Welcome, welcome, everyone. Welcome on this beautiful day to this most fantastic lecture that we're about to hear from Dr. Janine Hill Fletcher from Fordham University. I want to welcome everyone, remind everyone that magically we have food in the back. So please help yourself to the food. Uh, you're free to get up in the middle of, you know, if you need a stretch, go back and get some food, that's fine. We're going to be here for an hour and a half. Um, and so just please make yourself comfortable and really just settle in and, and enjoy the lecture. My name is Chris Tirres. Uh, I teach in religious studies. I also teach with the Grace School for Applied Diplomacy. And I'm also the director for the Center of Religion, Culture, and Community here at DePaul University. And it's really an honor to be co-sponsoring this event with two other units at DePaul. So I would like to thank number one, Dr. Bill Kavanaugh, who is the director of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology, because he has come together and partnered with us to bring Dr. Hill Fletcher here today. And we're also partnering with the Office of Institutional Diversity and Equity, OIDE, here at DePaul University. And Jose Perales is, our, is the representative. He's in the back. He's here with us today. I want to thank Jose and also Liz Ortiz for lending their support for this very important discussion. I would also like to just point out that there's some techies in the middle of the room who are doing their thing. Karen Kraft and Marlon Ag Aguilar, uh, Aguilar. So thank you for the live stream that you're doing right now. Uh, and I'm sorry, I don't, what is it? Elliot. Elliot, and Elliot. So thank you, because they're working magic that we can't even see right now, virtual magic. So thank you, they are the very capable team from the, for the, from the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology. Uh, and I would also like to thank Mose Lema, who is running interference right now, there she is. Mose Lema is the student assistant for the CRTC, and really she is the backbone of, the, of, the, of what we do at the CRTC. So thank you, Mose, for all of the details that you have taken care of to bring us to this very point. So before we begin, I would like to be actually begin this hour and a half with by reading the DePaul Land Acknowledgement Statement. And this, is a, this lecture here, it's a public lecture, but it also happens to be the time of my class. So I have a number of students here today for uh, Religion 291. This is a course in Liberation Theology. And they know that we begin the course, we begin our course, with a reading of the land acknowledgement statement. So now that we're six weeks into the course, I invite all of you, and but especially my students, to listen to the land acknowledgement statement once again and see if now we are making new connections to what this lecture is all about. At DePaul University, we acknowledge that we live and work on traditional native lands that are today. At DePaul University, we acknowledge that we live and work on traditional native lands that are today home to representatives of well over 100 different tribal nations. We extend our respect to all of them, including the Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Odawa nations, who signed the Treaty of Chicago in 1821 and 1833. We also recognize the Ho-Chunk, Miamia, Menominee, Illinois Confederacy, and Peoria people who also maintained relationships with this land. We acknowledge that these sacred homelands were ruptured by the European invasion of the Americas. In 1493, Pope Alexander VI promulgated the Doctrine of Discovery, which seized native lands and resources with impunity. This doctrine has been used by countries throughout the Americas 
including the U.S., to legitimize colonial policies of displacement and genocide toward Native peoples and to justify colonial legacies of white superiority and global capitalism. We appreciate that today Chicago is home to one of the largest urban Native populations in the United States. We further recognize and support the enduring presence of Native peoples among our faculty, staff, and student body. And in the spirit of St. Vincent de Paul, we reaffirm our commitment, both as an institution and as individuals, to help make our community and our society a more equitable, welcoming, and just place for all. So now our speaker. Dr. Janine Hill Fletcher is a constructive theologian whose research is at the intersection of Christian systematic theology and issues of diversity, including gender, race, and religious diversity. One of the very cool things is that she is Chicago made. She is coming home. She grew up in the Chicago suburbs in Westchester and attended the University of Illinois where she studied English. She spent a year after her college uh, with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. And from there, she went on to pursue a master's and a doctorate in theological education at Harvard Divinity School. And that's where I first got to meet Dr. Hill Fletcher. She has uh, written three books. The first book is called Monopoly or Salvation, a Feminist Response to Religious Pluralism. Her second book is called Motherhood as Metaphor, Engendering Religious Dialogues. And of course, her third book, many of you have read, is The Sin of White Supremacy, Christianity, Racism, and Religious Diversity in America, published by Orbis in 2017. She's been very active around many anti-racism initiatives at, on her campus at Fordham University. And she also works with the grassroots social justice organization in the Bronx called the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition, which is an intergenerational, multiracial, multi-religious group organizing to address social justice issues in New York City and beyond. And this is one of the reasons that I love Janine Hill Fletcher, because she can not only do the scholarly work and write the books and talk about the ideas, but she's also a committed activist herself. And she is with these community folks, so she, she, she sees it on both levels, both the theory and the practice. And I think we're going to get a sense of that today from her. Her current work is tentatively titled Grace of Ghosts, a Theology of Institutional Accountability, which we may hear a little bit about today. And this looks at what college campuses as the site of illicitly received benefits from the sins of white supremacy and asks how our institutions can be locations for social change. And as many of us know at DePaul, these are part of our discussions. This is, this is, this is hot right now, right? Struggling with our own legacy, Vincentian legacy of slavery, struggling with questions of diversity, equity, inclusion, and really trying to move forward, make a path forward where we can be a more, more just, equitable, and diverse institution ourselves. So I think that there can be no better time to have a speaker like Dr. Janine Hill Fletcher. Please help me welcome her to the stage. All right, so thank you all, uh, all of you who put uh, the effort into making this afternoon happen, and all of you uh, who don't realize that you've put the effort into making this afternoon happen because you are the ones who have apparently read the book most recently, and I'm going to be leaning into your questions uh, after I spend about the first, just to give you a roadmap of where, where, of where we're going. We'll spend about the first 20 minutes 
where I want to situate this book in relation to the broader conversation of liberation theology and in relation to the central foundational text of Gustavo Gutierrez, A Theology of Liberation. Uh, thinking about how, for me, this encounter with uh, coming to see more clearly the sin of white supremacy in my own country helped me to say, oh, wait a minute, liberation theology isn't about what's going on in Latin America. It's what's about what's going on right here in my own uh, neighborhoods. Um, and so I want to spend about the first 20 minutes teasing out some of those critical uh, conceptual moments of the book, analytical moments of the book, and then I want to open up and ask the students and others who have read the book, what are your questions? What have I left out in terms of the things that you think are interesting to uh, engage with the ideas of the church being involved with uh, the structural sins of white supremacy? Um, then, if there's time, I'm going to hope that I can squeeze in a little bit of my new work and see where you think that might, might be uh, productive for us within religiously-based institutions that have been at the center of, and, and in a sense you see in this text, um, engines driving the ideologies of white supremacy and the ideologies of Christian supremacy. So what do we do when we recognize that the institutions that we are part of have in the past been the places that generated the ideas that made it seem reasonable uh, to uh, exploit indigenous peoples, to enslave peoples of African descent, uh, to keep wealth building from out of the hands of, of many in this country. So let me begin uh, in the connection that I would make to the broader work of liberation theology uh, with the work of Gustavo Gutierrez. Um, I know some of you have done some work uh, around Gus Gutierrez's uh, impact in this theological conversation. And when I turned back to Gutierrez, I said, you know what, the place that I am intersecting most directly is with his understanding of history. Right? Um, so I'm going to set up the question for you. If you haven't read the text directly, I'm going to set up the question for you. Those of you who know Gutierrez might, might lean into this question. A lot of religious people tend to come at history and kind of think of it as sort of temporary, right? It's a temporal realm. And there's another realm that's the eternal realm, right? Or you might hear in a church, well, we're about the spiritual, right? We're not about the political, right? And so Gutierrez, in one of my favorite chapters of Theology of Liberation, chapter 9, he advances a discussion in response to that um, and those of you who have familiarity with, with uh, Gutierrez, do you have any sense? This is where we start to test out whether this uh, group participation is going to work for us this afternoon. Um, would you have any idea what he might say to that way in which theologians or church people or Christians might say, you know what, we've got two different realms. One is spiritual, one's political. We've got two different realms. One is temporal, one's eternal. We've got two different realms, right? One is secular, and one is the realm of the church. Any idea what he might say to that? Come on, I know you know this. Anyone want to venture into that? Yeah, that dualism that, he, that, that, that seems to be part of a modern way of thinking. Yeah, what, what do you think? He would say exactly that they're all interrelated. And if you, if you had your text, this is my text from way back when Dr. Tiras and I knew each other in graduate school. So it's a little bit well-worn. But you would open up to chapter 9, and you would read that response to this tendency toward dualism. Uh, in the direct title of this section, he simply says, history is one. He says, uh, there are not two histories, one profane and one sacred, juxtaposed or closely linked. Rather, there is only one human destiny, irreversibly assumed by Jesus, he, he describes. So he's concerned about how Jesus' work isn't just spiritual, right? He's going to lean in and suggest that Jesus' work is actually engaged in the realities of history, including the social and the political. 
right? He says Jesus' redemptive work embraces all the dimensions of existence and brings them to their fullness. Here's what I want you to hear. The history of salvation is the very heart of human history. Salvation, he writes, the communion of human beings with God and among themselves orients, transforms, and guides history to its fulfillment. Right, so instead of a modern tendency toward this dualism, this separation of the sacred and the profane, or the sacred and the secular, Gutierrez brings us right into the heart of human history. Right? And his, his uh, activation of that introduction of history right, is reflected also in the broader traditions of Vatican II, Right? and the embrace of history. And this is from Gaudium et Spes, from uh, those documents from 1965, where, the, where the, the, those gathered at, at Vatican II said, you know what, the church's goal right, is to carry forward the work of Christ under the lead of the befriending spirit. Okay, you might say that sounds like a spiritual endeavor. Right? But they go on to say, to carry out such a task, the church has always had the duty of scrutinizing the signs of the times and of interpreting them in the light of the gospel. So here we have history in one sense requiring that we attend to our moment in history. Right? Our moment in history, what's going on? And this is where uh, the documents of Vatican II, the approach of, of, of some within that strand of modern Catholic thought, and Gutierrez in particular says, look, we need the tools of social sciences to help us understand what's going on in the world so that we can interpret what's going on in the light of the gospel, right? Okay. Um, and the, 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 uh, the bishops of Vatican II thought a little further about this within Gaudium et Spes, right? What are we looking for when we're scrutinizing the signs of the times and reading them in the light of human flourishing that we believe the gospel to be uh, uh, promoting, right? And so uh, in Gaudium et Spes, this is probably my favorite paragraph from all of the documents of Vatican II, Right? They said, look, we have all of these different ways of cultural configuration around the globe, but no matter what ways we're organizing ourselves as a society, we as Christians, as Catholics, understand the call of the gospel to mean this, that there must be made available to all persons everything necessary for leading a life truly human, such as food, clothing, and shelter, the right to choose a state of life freely and to found a family, the right to education, to employment, to a good reputation, to respect, to appropriate information, to activity in accord with the upright norms of one's conscience, to protection of privacy, and, the, and to rightful matters, sorry, to rightful freedom in matters religious too. Right? This is a social portrait, right? And, by, and once we've moved from a spiritual to a social, this is a political portrait. Right? Because how do we ensure that people have access to food, clothing, and shelter? Right? How do we have, have uh, assurances that they, have, uh, they can fulfill that right to education and employment? Right? Once we move into the social, we're thinking about those structures that make that reality possible. Right? But here's where we're shifting to, uh, and those of you who read uh, uh, Sin of White Supremacy, I think it's on page 83 that you're like, oh yeah, Janine really likes this, this passage from Vatican II. I think this is the heart of the vision that the sin of white supremacy is trying to say, look, this might be the vision, right? It's a spiritual, social, political vision, but how are we doing here in the US? How are we doing in, in light of this? Right? And it's at that point that I bring in the social uh, scientific data right, about the ways in which these measures of human flourishing, and I've, I've added healthcare here, but these are some of the ones, uh, the, the ways that the, that the document of Vatican II articulates this, right, that on the measures of human flourishing that we can identify and we can see, and we might all agree that yes, that's what we're, that's what we're aiming towards, right, that in the history of this country, human access to that flourishing has been racialized. And now for those of you who read Sin of White Supremacy, I think that between the time that I wrote that and, and today, I have become a little bit more uh, engaged in my own thinking about this idea of racialization, right? So you can look at this and you can say, okay, the data shows us 
right, that we have disparities in terms of access to healthy food on the basis of the social scientific data through the lens of race, right? Access to adequate housing, education, employment, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, but I want to underscore this concept here of racialization because that is one of the tools of the social sciences right now that would help us to say, yes, this is on the basis of race, but it actually is on the basis of racism. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back around to that, to that distinction. Okay. So uh, we could have an entire uh, other session, and it, it, would, it would take us a while, but we could go through each of the data points, right? The lens on our moment today and ask the question, how are we doing with education? Right? Do we have access to that form of full human flourishing that the bishops of Vatican II envisioned? Do we have adequate access when we look through the, the lens or the measure of, of race? Right? Same thing with healthy food, same thing with access to health care, same thing with privacy and freedom and respect. Right? The, the social scientific data says, look, the U.S. is in a really, uh, a really long struggle Right? in which access to these forms of human flourishing have not been equally distributed according to race. Right? But the, the term that I want to un, uh, unpack just a little bit here is this idea of racialization. Right? Um, because if we think about, and I'm going to do a few, more, a, a few more slides here that kind of give you uh, the, 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 mm, the snapshot for me, right? We can go to all the data points, sorry. We can go to each of the uh, social sciences in each of these areas, and we can see this racialized disparity on all of these measures. But for me, uh, and those of you who might remember the, the Pew report uh, that, I, that I use as a leverage in that book, uh, the Pew report uh, a number of years ago that simply put this data out directly. Right? And said, if you want to measure human flourishing on the basis of access to wealth, and in a capitalist society, and I'll go back here, right, we rely on private wealth, economic capital to have access to each of these things. Right? So if we have a, 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 a single data point that you would see informed my thinking about this, right, it has to do with the racialized wealth gap. Right? And we can come back to these, uh, these slides if they are helpful to us. But on a number of different, uh, a number of different ways of measuring, uh, and each of these slides kind of gives a, a slightly different um, setup, right? But over these uh, most recent generations of the American project, we have a significant wealth gap. Right? And this one here just adds on uh, this. It does it in a slightly different way. Uh, and it adds on white, black, and Latino, right? Um, and if our access to the wealth that might bring human flourishing is this uh, radically racialized, we need to ask the question not only uh, how are we doing, right, with this distribution of, of wealth and flourishing, but how did we get here, right? How did we get to the point where this could be the reality that we are living in, and this reality of a lack of access to the full uh, forms of human flourishing right, is the reality that we're living in. How did we get here? Right? Um, and so I, uh, in, in, uh, in my own thinking as a theologian, right, uh, I've leaned into the insights of sociologists, and this is one of my, my favorite right now, uh, Deadrick Williams from the University of Tennessee, who asks us to look at data like this, and, and data on any one of those measures that I had in that range of human flourishing, and ask us to recognize that we're not studying the effects of race as an essentialized category. We are studying the effects of racialization or racism, right? And so understanding that lens, I want to I spend just uh, a, a little bit of my time here um, pausing and unpacking this concept of racialization, because this becomes a really crucial component in thinking about how this disparity came to be in our moment and how this disparity actually has a history. 
right? So that we're opening up into uh, a second way of understanding history. One is the texture of our history in this moment, but the second is having an embrace of understanding our history of how we got here, right? Um, and so this concept of racialization, right? If you Google it, and this is, I think, I think what I have here is uh, Miriam Webster, right? What is racialization, right? And they say, it's the process of categorizing according to race. So okay, that's what we're talking about, categorizing according to race. But sociologists Michael Omi and Howard Wynant want us to think about not categorizing according to essentialized racial categories that are somehow biologically determined. They want us to think about racialization as a project. And so their, their foundational text is this one here. It's called Racial Formation in the United States. And they talk about racial formation or uh, uh, different racial projects. And they ask us to see that there are three steps in the US racial project. Right? And this conceptualization here, I think, becomes very, very useful as a lens on how we got here. Right? And asking the question, well, if this is the way by which we got to this racialized reality, could we see an alternative way out of this racialized reality? OK. So we're thinking about how we came to this history of, sorry, how we came to this moment of racialized disparities on all of these different uh, measures. And Omi and Wynant offer us the idea, or the lens, or the theory, uh, or the analysis, that the disparities of uh, according to race can be traced all the way back to the US's foundational racial project, in which three things happened. First, theorists, philosophers, theologians, anthropologists imagined the different categories of the races. Right? They imagined that. That's what, that's what sociologists mean when they say race is a social construction. Right? And Omi and why not want to make sure that we recognize that this happened at a particular point in time, right? That those categories of the races, of white, of black, of, of, of Indian, uh, as, as, the, as someone like Kant here in the middle, a philosopher uh, in the Enlightenment period, as they were thinking through, well, if we wanna, if we wanna categorize people, here are, the categori here are the categories that people fit into. But one of the things that Omi and Why Not want us to absolutely see is that this formation of the various racial categories was happening at a particular moment in time. Right? And we heard with your land acknowledgment uh, the, the history of colonialism and the doctrine of discovery. Right? Shortly thereafter, Enlightenment thinkers began to say, well, these people that we're encountering, how should we think about them? Right? And what Omi and Wynant say uh, directly, uh, page 59 of their racial formation, they say racial categories were never merely a form of anthropological classification. They always entailed and were in service to social and political functions. Right? So this was never a neutral project of just looking out and saying, oh, let, let's see where we, we, we think we should fit these, these folks that we're encountering. It was, uh, sociologists uh, have a, um, there seems to be a, a scholarly consensus that in the Enlightenment period, there was a, was a clear and direct desire to create a set of racial categories that would help to propel uh, the colonial project. And so that, that set of, of racial categories uh, became developed in a hierarchical manner in which white uh, uh, appeared on top almost uh, pretty much every time. I'm not even sure if I can think of a theorist who, who didn't have it um, organized that way, right? So in the three steps of the US racial project, the category of the races were created with inherent characteristics. People were sorted into them. And then material benefits were granted or withheld on the basis of one's race. Right? And we can talk a little bit more about this concept of racialization. Right, this concept of there being a racial project that then was passed down and created that racialized disparity that we experience today. But those of you who have uh, engaged the sin of white supremacy, and I'm about to turn it over to you with the questions that you have, you might remember that I really was wrestling with 
my own relearning of a history by which the racial project dispossessed indigenous people, stole lives and labors from people of African descent, withheld uh, the projects of wealth building for people that were categorized in categories other than white, right? And that it's only by relearning that history and seeing the way that the church was involved in that project, right, that I, that relearn that history and say, oh, that's how we got where we are today with this racialized disparity. Right? And so the three critical moments uh, that I look at in terms of racial categories and racialization that have been used in US history to uh, gain access to these uh, spheres of human well-being or deny access to these spheres of human well-being. Um, sorry, I have another set of thinkers here right, where I'm wrestling with history. These are my three critical elements. Right? Uh, the, dispossess the dispossession of indigenous peoples, right? a project over time in which uh, scholars and politicians and theologians imagined a category into which to fit indigenous people, reasoned on the base of it, right? that indigenous people didn't have a right to this land. And we can talk a little bit more if you're interested about the theologizing right? that, that by which white Christians uh, dispossessed indigenous people from the land. So these two different maps that, that, that just remind us of that reality. Uh, the second, right, the theologies uh, by which I, uh, peoples of African descent were sorted into a particular category with the use of scriptural reasoning uh, by politicians, by theologians, by scholars, by legislators, right, and uh, extracted lives and labor, and this is the data that comes from uh, David Hacker, who is a demographic historian from the University of Minnesota, right? Um, extracted lives and labor from roughly 10 million enslaved people in the US. That's the, that's the data point that, that he uses. There's a, there's a uh, you can calculate that in a variety of ways. Um, but the data that he offered in 2020, right, in 2020, <laughs> Now I'm going to digress. Um, in 2020, he wrote this little article because although Americans and, and American scholars have understood that the foundational economy was an economy of extraction of, land, of lives and labor, in 2020, there was no agreement as to how many persons and lives had been lost and extracted from. Right, so in 2020, he has to say, here, here's what some scholars say. Here's another range that other scholars say. And he said, look, let's calculate it, and let's, and let's roughly imagine that it was 107, sorry, 179 million person years that were stolen under that economy of enslavement. And let's roughly calculate that to 410 billion hours of mostly unpaid labor. Right? But it's 2020 that, that scholars are finally saying, let's reckon with this, right? This isn't some imaginary reality that happened. This is an actual reality that built wealth for some Americans and denied access to well-being for 10 million others, right? OK, so wrestling with that, continuing to wrestle with that, um, and realizing that our institutions of church and school we benefited from that. I mean, that's part of the new project is to say, this extraction of life and labor, it, it didn't happen nowhere, it happened everywhere. And the life and the labor and the, and the wealth that came from out of that, it didn't go nowhere, it went into our schools, it went into our churches, right? Uh, and so this sense of needing to reckon and wrestle with that history Right, is part of uh, what started in this first book and continues, uh, continues today. Uh, the third um, era or element or uh, crucial point in this reckoning with history uh, is to recognize the ways in which the project of redlining uh, and the whole uh, early 20th century and into the middle of the 20th century by which white property was protected Right, is another way in which wealth was built by white Americans and withheld by uh, those who had been sorted into other categories. 
Um, so those of you who read uh, the, the um, keep referencing the book, and I'm just about to ask you your questions on it. Um, this is one of those places, right, that was, that was never uh, in my understanding of history. No one ever had, had said to me, right, hey, look, you want to know about racial disparity and wealth disparity? Take a look at how the government distributed the funds for uh, home ownership in this era, and take a look at the, the manual that was used. I should have brought mine with me. I brought it with me. This is how racialized wealth disparity grows, right? Not in one moment, not in a dozen moments, but in hundreds of thousands, I don't know, I can't calculate it, but hundreds of thousands of millions of moments by which people like the, the, the real estate folks picked up their, uh, their manual and they said, okay, we want to we wanna have some sense of whether we should be uh, granting a mortgage in this location. Right? The government's going to make these funds available. We're going to direct them to Americans to help build their wealth. Right? But let's make sure that we do this in a way that we're protecting our investment. And so they used the racial hierarchy into which persons had already been sorted for, a num for, for, for uh, generations. Right? And so this sense that, um, and I have uh, Mr. Hoyt uh, highlighted here, right? the hundreds of thousands of millions of ways that racialization and racial wealth disparity was generated, here's the real estate people. Right? We have some of their forms that describe uh, their assessments. Um, and then we have uh, Homer Hoyt, who was a University of Chicago uh, economist. Right? And so we have the production of uh, the ideologies of white supremacy Right, happening in all kinds of different places. Okay, so we have, uh, through the systems of white supremacy, wealth generated for white Americans, but access to wealth building denied to black, indigenous, and Latinx Americans um, as, I think, uh, a reality that we can use social science, we can use an engagement of history, and we can use our, our commitment to Gutierrez who asks us to see this not as an unfortunate reality, but to see this as contrary to the kind of salvation that his liberation theology envisions, right? The kind of salvation by which human flourishing, right? And the liberation from oppression is part of God's work in the world. Right? Um, so that gives you what I think are some of the I don't know, when I went back to the book and thought about it in relation to the liberation theology, those are the places that I came to, right? In terms of asking the question, do we as theologians, do we as, uh, as people engaged in both uh, US history and in the project of theology, do we reckon with the details, right? Do we take that seriously? Because if Gutierrez, if we want to follow Gutierrez, I just want to read that statement again. History is one. One. It's a singular history, right? Salvation, the communion of human beings with God and among our, themselves, orients, transforms, and guides history to its fulfillment. Right? So if this is the reality that we see in our moment in history, what does it look like? What does it feel like? What, does it, what, does it, uh, what are the actions we can take that might align us with that project of liberation that Gutierrez uh, says is God's project in human history? OK, so I am at the point where I want to uh, take a little break from my speaking and ask if there are questions on the content of Sin of White Supremacy uh, that I highlighted or that you read about um, uh, that we can engage for a little while that, and then I can see if there's time to, to ask you questions about the new project. What should we talk about? Um, I'll, you know, I'll ask you questions. Have you ever heard this reality preached in your church? OK, we see some yeses. We see some noes. Yes, we see some yeses. OK. Um, could the, 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 it's two questions for me. 
Has the church, and now that's, that's a very big imaginative category, has the church been an engine that resists the racialization and, and the white supremacy that we can see funneling through institutions, right? Or has the church been uh, an engine of institutionalized white supremacy in these ver various eras? Those of you who, those of you who uh, journeyed with me, and I know that there are some of you here because Dr. Dr. Tiras and I talked about uh, the fact that you did read this, right? Where was the church in this history? We got, we've, got, we've got one ready. In my, in my uh, classroom, it, sometimes our conversations go slow because we, we practice the three and me principle, which is we need a couple more people before we come back to somebody who's already offered a, uh, an answer because we're all leaning on one person. So, what was my question? <laughs> Where was the church in all this? And I think that that's my question for today. Where was the church in all this in our past history? And where are church institutions today? Right? Yeah, uh, we, I, we, we got one, two, and then we can come back to three. Go ahead. So, so that's one of the things that was, so um, I'm not sure if, if folks on the, on the live stream can hear the responses, because I have the roaming mic here, um, but the sense that the church was actively involved in this process of racialization and the elevation of white, the, the, those who had been uh, racialized as white, it was one of the things that was so shocking to me as a theologian who spent most of my life, uh, my, most of my career dealing with issues of religious diversity, and I could earn tenure at a, at a uh, I, could, I could move my way through a highly ranked theological program, I could earn tenure at a, a Catholic university and never even have a, an idea about the ways in which the church was involved in this process and practice of white supremacy. Right. Um, uh, any other thoughts on that? Excellent. Separating so, the church. Okay, yeah. yeah, the separation from the church is like this foundational uh, key to constructing the modern human, and then now it can be this liberatory agent. Like I don't understand how that comes to be, considering that in even in ra racial formation theory, like they start off saying religion was the first like racial project. S so the, so the que so um, the question is can the church be a l how can the church be a liberating institution if it was part of of the the, the problem something like that um, part of uh, one w a number of ways into that one of which is to recognize the ways uh, that there were those who had been uh, impacted by the church's uh, the, 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 the one area of the church's um, engagement with the projects of white supremacy, and nevertheless found in that same tradition resources for liberation, right? And I think that that is the, so if you look at the black church tradition, for example, right? Um, enslaved people uh, in this country used the biblical text, right? That was the same biblical text that was used by enslavers and found in that biblical text uh, ways in which to affirm God on the side of liberation. Right? So it's a fundamental, um, it's a fundamental uh, knot or tension. Right? That is, does the scriptural text say one thing? And this, this reality that we're looking at here is completely contrary to what's written in the text. Right? Or is the text itself complex? 
and in some ways fed into the project of white supremacy, right? Um, and I think that the I think that the response that I have come to there is to see in the scriptural text a variety of of resources, some of which can lend themselves and did lend themselves to uh, an interpretation of white that that enhanced white supremacy and others which lean into a more liberative uh, reading. Right? So the text itself is uh, a complex book that was used in lots of different ways. Right? Um, and, and, and I think that that leads me to say, we need to, take, we need to keep, um, hold those interpreters and those actors accountable for the ways they chose to interpret the text. Uh, because someone like uh, Joseph Barnt, uh, who deals with anti-racism and the church, someone like Jamar Tisby, who looks uh, in, his, in his work, The Color of Compromise, looks at the way that the church was on both sides of the struggle, right? So that, so that we can see Christians who were very much uh, propelling this uh, project of white supremacy, but we can also see Christians who were deeply rooted in that faith and, and, and uh, resisting. Um, so the question uh, now for me is, will the church uh, look at this history critically? And will it not only distance itself from that history, but denounce that history and choose to interpret the text in an anti-racist way? Right? But that's a choice. That's a choice that the church has to make in terms of Right? Recognizing that the church uh, can be both, or has been both, uh, the engine of systems of white supremacy and a possible resource for dismantling. Other, other th I know you had questions. Oh, question in the back. Yeah, I think, uh, the church, uh, from listening to, oh, sorry. Uh, from listening to uh, part of the land acknowledgement, the church, mm. clearly, the document of discovery, um, discusses its complicity mm -hmm. in, in all of this. Um, I also think of, uh, I'm, I'm um, struck by your question about the church. It's, one is the policy, the actions the, that are taken by the church. The other are more individuals mm -hmm. who feel a different way and, and maybe do something about an injustice. But um, I think, for example, about the church's clear complicity in mm -hmm the Indian boarding schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And really, it's, it's a genocidal step in getting rid of, you know, uh, of culture in these babies. Um, I think of other, other policies that were taken by the church. And more recently, um, we, uh, we attended an, a, a, an apology and an atonement, uh, an attempt to atone here at DePaul just a few days ago. And uh, I think about, you know, this is an ancient history. A few decades ago, we had uh, priests who were painting blackface on students. And when we think, for example, of institutions involved with uh, anti-blackness or, or any of these things, they're all horrific. But when we think of, a per of an institution that asks us to, you know, to aspire to more, mm -hmm. it becomes extremely disappointing. Mm. Uh, I, 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 um, there's, two, there's two points I want to draw out, and I wish that I had uh, slides for the more slides for the new project, which, which wrestles with precisely those very specific realities of church history in which the church, the, 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 the challenge that I wanted to underscore was that um, from a theological perspective, reading the texts of Christian educators who ran those uh, Indian boarding schools, they were continuing a long line of theologizing and thinking about indigenous peoples as needing to be saved, right? They had been racialized generations earlier as needing that education. They had been racialized in a way that made them childlike, right? They were childlike and they needed the help of Christian educators. Uh, they had been racialized and sorted into a category that was pagan, right? That, that came with their race. And if we look at the theologizing and the texts that were written uh, by those who were proponents of the Indian boarding school, they believed themselves to be doing God's work, 
right? And so we have to really kind of look at the ways that theology can be um, uh, intimately a part of projects, right, that, that dehumanize, right? And so from the perspective of, lo of, of looking back on some of this, we see those patterns, and I wanna ask us to see those patterns even today, right? Are there systems in our schools, right, that have been predominantly white serving schools that continue to hold up certain forms of knowledge, right, as the ideal, um, and require that others assimilate into those forms of knowledge, right? And so looking back at the history, looking back at the patterns of thought, are they still embedded in some of our institutions today? But the second thing that I wanted to draw out of that uh, insight was that institutions are institutions, but they're also made up of humans making decisions, right? So we say policy, we say legislation, and that is absolutely crucial to looking at the structural reality. But, but those policies and those decisions and those institutional choices are made up of, of, of individual humans making those choices, right? Um, and, and kind of ask, yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and see if there are other thoughts and questions on the process of racialization uh, and the role of the church in this. Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, first of all, very much enjoying your remarks and your presentation here. Um, I guess I just wanted to share a, a thought about that question. You, uh, um, uh, with regard to the process of, of racialization and then being anti-racist or something, um, in a broad generality, I think the church, um, and by the church, I, I gather you mean at least the Roman Catholic Church and maybe Christian. Christianity as a whole, but there's a lot of different flavors there. But I'll go with the term that we've been using, the church. I would be in some ways willing to, to concede that the church is anti-racist or is but p potentially I mean that that could, but there's a big difference between that and real justice and real equity and real opportunity mm. to access those um, at least in my mind there's a big difference just like there is a difference in actual enslavement of human beings and redlining and I think those are both horrific and sinful likewise it's not much for the church to be anti-racist. I think what, would the, what is going to be the real rub or what is challenging is for the church to be on the side of real equity and real justice and, and sort of in my, again, this is just my opinion, but in uh, relinquishing power or in sharing wealth or in sharing power and not, not just saying it's wrong, but then saying this is how we're going to try to reconcile it and atone for it. That's where, I, I think that's ask, asking more, I think that's harder, mm -hmm. but I think that needs to be done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're anticipating um, a, a slide that's coming up in terms of um, what do we do with this history and this reality, um, and can we work to uh, respond, redress, repair, engage in the process of reparations as uh, institutions? Um, the only, the only uh, thing that I don't have kind of prepared as a way of responding to the first part of what, of what you said, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that the church that I know is anti-racist. Um, my, my sense is more that, that the church that I know um, is filled with people who want to say, let's be nice to each other, right? Let's be kind, let's treat each other as full human beings. Yes, of course, right? But the anti-racist perspective says, well, that's really not enough. And it really leans into that, that question of, of uh, uh, redress and rebalance and shared partnership and shared opportunity and all of that, right? So uh, the only thing that, that stuck with me in your, in your remarks was that sense of, well, what are each of us using with the term anti-racism, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the classic line that says it's not enough to be not racist, and I think that from out of its, its history, the Catholic Church, I will, I, will put it, I will put it more specifically here, the Ch Catholic Church in the United States, the new project really says, wow, at almost every turn, we were not just not racist, we were actively white supremacist. Like I see the ways 
that the church used its theologies to prioritize white well-being and distribute its resources uh, uh, primarily toward white Catholics. Um, so I can look at the data of history and I can say, okay, well, at least maybe at this moment in, in Catholic history in the U.S., maybe we're not actively racist and white supremacist as, as we can see in the history, um, but, but are we yet anti-racist, right? Are we yet saying, uh, uh, you know, that, that, the, that the transformation of the systems needs to be part of the church's work? And I just wanted to pause right at the moment back to the question earlier about how the church could be a site of liberation. When I talk about, in my own work, when I talk about the, uh, the church being, a, uh, you know, I, I follow the, I think it's the, the, the Black Clergy Caucus of the, uh, the Catholic Church in, I think it's 1968, where they said, you know, the church is a white racist institution. Like, that's, that's where it aligns its values. Um, and so there are elements in, uh, in policy and practice that I would say, well, that elevated whiteness and elevated white people, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna name that as racist. Um, but I also see the ways in which black Catholics found those ways of resisting that and found life and the life-giving you know, realities within the church. Right? And so uh, uh, a history like uh, Shannon Williams' new history on, what's it called, subversive habits on black Catholic uh, women religious, right? where, where she's saying, look, I know that this history is a history of an institutional church that prioritized white well-being, and we might want to say that it was, in fact, a white supremacist institution, but we also have evidence of it being a location in which black and indigenous and Indian and Latinx and, and uh, Asian Catholics found locations to resist white supremacy. And so actually the, the, the new book is kind of saying, well, I know nothing about that history, right? How, I, I can trace the history of, uh, of high profile theology um, and institutional practice being, uh, having, having uh, the, the traces of racism, um, but I can also see now, when I go into the archives, stories of resistance, right? And so that goes back to the, the, the question here. How can the church be both of those things? Well, if we look historically at another set of resources, like the stories from the archives, we see that the church has been that, right? And so how do we think about the church today as having resources that may have arrived through these structures and systems of illicit wealth building, Right? But that might still be an institution that could redistribute that, right? Um, I, I, in this section, I've got, I've got all the time in the world, but I do have another section that, that goes on to that, uh, the point that, that was raised there in terms of the church and uh, redress. And I'm gonna jump over these here, but I do wanna come back to that. Doo -doo. Um, yeah, I know where I'm going here. Um, Okay, do I want to pause here? I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to jump ahead uh, to uh, a place in uh, the, my, my new thinking. Since engaging with uh, the history that I had not known uh, in developing my own thoughts and engagement and theology from out of uh, tracing theology's embeddedness in the sins of white supremacy, since that time, I have been looking more deeply at individual institutions and specific stories within these different eras that I trace in, in that earlier book. But also in the meantime, I've been thinking with the work of uh, Duke Kwan and Gregory Thompson, um, who will recount this same sort of history, but they will use a lens of analysis that says, well, when we're talking about the US as a culture of racism, we're talking about the US as a culture of white supremacy, but it's really helpful for us to use the lens of analysis of theft, right? And we can think about the illicit wealth that, that came from uh, stolen land, stolen lives, stolen labor, Right, but they also talk about the project of theft having many different dimensions, right? The first dimension, they say, is a theft of history, right? The fact that in many of our educational institutions, and that's what the earlier slide's in the middle here, the, the raging struggle that we have right now all across the nation in school boards, 
right? And in legislation that wants to hide certain aspects of U.S. history, right? That, Quan and Thompson would say, participates in the theft of history, right? The theft of history by which educational uh, uh, projects within the U.S tell a different story, right? They tell a story of white founding fathers who brought the church to a new country and who established democracy, and now we have this glorious nation, right? So the sense in which uh, the story of history has to be taken seriously, has to be retold, we, we come back with Gutierrez and we say, it's not just any history that we're looking at. Right? It's the history in its texture, and we have to pay attention to those places where history is whitewashed, right? where history is stolen from, uh, from us right? in terms of being able to see clearly, well, what actually happened and how did we get to this racialized uh, disparity that we experience? Um, they describe uh, the project of uh, repair that's needed to be uh, undertaken as including also that theft of identity. And, and the project of racialization, they will say, was a theft of identity. Right? When, when anthropologists and philosophers and theologians said, OK, let me tell you about this category black. Right? And they filled that category with all sorts of things that served white interests. Quan and Thompson say that project of racialization was a theft of identity. Right? Same thing, when, when, when anthropologists and philosophers and theologians created the category Indian or indigenous and filled it with all sorts of uh, characteristics that would serve white interests and then passed it down over generations, that was a theft of identity. Right? Um, the, in the history of the US, a theft of history, theft of identity included also a theft of power, right? Access to those places of decision making, those places of governance, um, access to the legislative bodies, right? So the sense in which our history as a nation also includes the theft of power, right? And finally, that final one that was part of our, uh, our uh, analysis to begin with, right? this theft of wealth. OK, but now here's where the new book. I mean, you follow me so far, right, that there are various categories of theft in this, in this history of racialization and the racial project by which uh, uh, white supremacy was, was created. Uh, if we, by, if we uh, lean into that lens of theft, we have to ask those questions about our own institutions. Right? Do we know our history? Do we tell our history accurately? I know I'm being live streamed. I don't know if I'm being taped. But my own Catholic uh, institution of higher education, we tell our history that we were founded uh, in order to serve and uplift and educate the poor Irish immigrants to the US in the middle of the 19th century. Right? And in fact, we did do that work. But if you open our 1852 catalog, you will see that half of the students have that profile, and another half of the students come from other places in the US, including those that were deeply embedded in an economy of enslavement. So we were welcoming slavers, some of the students uh, who owned human beings themselves. We were welcoming the families, the prominent Catholic families, who had built their wealth and were continuing to build their wealth through an economy of enslavement. But we don't say anything about that in our history. Right? And I'm a theologian. I'm not trained in history. I, read, I started reading uh, the, the Brown Report. I started reading Craig Wilder's Ebony and Ivory, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America's Universities. And, and he talked about that history in all of these uh, institutions. I said, wait a minute. My institution was founded in 1841. How could we have extracted ourselves from an economy of enslavement? Right? But we have to say that about every institution across the nation. Ch Catholic churches, Catholic schools. Right? How did they, did they find their wealth right, through these systems of an, an economy of enslavement? And when we don't tell that story, Right? Are we participating in the theft of history? Right? By which we would take what Gutierrez is asking us to do, we would take history seriously. And we would say, look, we were the, the church was deeply embedded in, in projects of sin. 
right? How do we repair that? Okay, um, theft of identity. Who created those categories of racialization? Philosophers, educators, theologians? Not, not people, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know, off on their own, but people within our institutions, right? And so when I look back at some of the writings of our uh, earlier figures, I say, hey, wait a minute. They were producing knowledge, they were publishing knowledge about indigenous peoples at precisely the time that indigenous peoples are being dispossessed of their land. How is that not participation in the theft of identity from out of our educational institutions? Right, but we, like, so uh, the, the, the racial hierarchy that the mortgage lending manual used, it's like that didn't come from nowhere. That came from universities, right? That came from higher education, where people were imagining and using those racial categories uh, from, uh, from before. Ooh, theft of power, right? Do we know? about the ways in which our institutions denied or promoted access to power, right? Uh, uh, I don't know, somebody, some, some scholar I was reading at, at, at some point said, oh, you white, predominantly white-serving institutions, you love to highlight your firsts, right? Your first black student, your first Latinx student, you love to highlight that on your, on your history line. But what about all those students who came before that you denied, right? Um, I am, I am, we were doing this last night, Googling around and seeing uh, what ways institutions were wrestling with this. And I'm pretty sure it was DePaul that, that had a student-run magazine. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, you can Google it. My students are always on their computers. I'm always like, oh, just Google that for me. Um, student-run magazine that, that maybe went into the archives and found a memo from 1934. Yes, okay, I'm, on, I'm, not, I'm not misidentifying this. 14 E. 14 East. So the, so the student magazine must have gone into the archives, right? Theft of history, what don't we tell? They must have gone into the archives because they scanned the memo in which the administrators are saying, yeah, up to this point, we have done a pretty good job of keeping black students out, right? And, and you will see in that memo the reality that they wrote out explicitly that we're going to make it harder for black students. We're gonna make it harder. We're gonna make it harder for them to meet the criteria because we're gonna elevate the criteria when it comes to black students. It says that in the memo, right? And then it says, if they happen to arrive at that place where they've gotten through all of those barriers we've put up, we're gonna gently let them know that this place probably would not be hospitable to having them here. 1934, right? But that is a theft of power, denying access to countless students, denying the access of social capital, where we network and we get to know each other and then we find jobs in those ways. Denial of access to cultural capital, which education is. It gives you the tools to be recognized in a society, right, and to, and to uh, enter and engage and contribute, right, and of course the denial of access to wealth building that education brings with economic capital, right. Um, so theft of wealth, right, is part of that theft of history that I already pointed to, but the, but the, the insight from uh, the, the earlier comment, right, not only is the church in a uh, imaginatively big way, right? If we think about the church in a big way, is the church in a big way willing to reckon with the ways in which it participated in these thefts? But more specifically, will church institutions, right? Will Catholic institutions of higher learning wrestle with this? Will, will Catholic parishes wrestle with any of this? Right? And so the, the, the question or the uh, insight that was raised earlier, right, the church might not be actively racist anymore, right? but in order to be anti-racist, it would need to deal with past sins and, and, and engage in some sort of repair. And Quan and Thompson do a really beautiful job because they are uh, they're scholars of religion, and I'm not sure whether they characterize themselves as biblical scholars or, or sociologists or theologians, but they go to the biblical text 
And they say, look, if, if we want to take this seriously as Christians, who think about history as the place where we participate with God's salvation, right, then we have to really uh, uh, reckon with our past and be willing to transform uh, our future. Right? Um, and so uh, the sense of uh, the, the new book essentially is, is asking questions about specific institutions, uh, the, the stories that we can see in the archives, the possibilities that things could have been otherwise, and then invites us into the question of whether institutions will engage in the project of repair and reparations. Um, so when I was going through, uh, it's great because the things that I found uh, online are already part of uh, the, the awareness or the sense or the conversations that's on, that are ongoing uh, here at DePaul. Um, you know, but the sense that the Treaty of Chicago in 1833 is not, I mean, it's, it's almost 100 years, or maybe that's a little under 70 years, right? But, you know, the, 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 the reality of uh, the building up of an institution uh, in the wake of dispossession is something I think each of our institutions uh, have to continue to wrestle with. Um, the, this was before uh, the, the uh, public apology, and I'm, I'd be, uh, I will be curious to learn more about that. Right? What is the function of, uh, of, of recognizing the history? Right, That's the first step. But then how do we use that recognizing to, to engage a reckoning that leads to, to reparation? Um, and I think that many institutions are in the, I mean, many institutions are not even reckoning with their histories. Right, And so the, the various stages of this, but then to say, OK, what do we do differently? Um, and then I, you know, I, I, I don't, I, this is just, this is just the, uh, from the era of redlining, uh, the way in which the assessor's uh, labeling of the location in which uh, DePaul was found. I don't know if that's a story of resistance, right? That DePaul said, no, we're gonna make a commitment to the people who live here, we're gonna stay. Um, or whether it was a story of, of another form of extraction. No, we're gonna take over and we're gonna ask other, or require that other people leave. Um, I don't know what that history is, but that's a part of, of, of the reckoning as well. Um, yeah, and these are just, you know, I just think, th I think that this framework gives us all of these questions, right? How do we teach our own, how do we tell our institutional history? How do we teach history? How do we restore identities uh, for all for, f uh, uh, for full flourishing? How does our institution provide access to shared power? And what will we do to repay what we have gained from past structures and systems of white supremacy? Um, and, and quite honestly, uh, you're the first live audience that I've asked these questions with. Um, and, and so up to this point, it's been sort of in the library putting these pieces together. And I'm curious your thoughts Will Christian and Catholic institutions um, and institutions of both church and school and higher ed institutions, will we be engines of transformation, right? Or will we be passive, uh, passive in light of the status quo, or will we be actively uh, white supremacist? Uh, all of those options are possible. Um, so, I, I, I do not know what my next slide is, but I think that this is the last one. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, I know what I wanted to say, right? Which is, the college campuses have been and can be locations of change, right? So the, the very sense of transforming identities within the student body, these are just five, five pictures, right, that say, you know what, DePaul has been committed to uh, transformation and uh, expanding and welcoming and incorporating in our, in our student body, right? So this is, this is 58, and this is the 60s, and this is 67. Institutions have been locations for change, but it's always a struggle, right? It's not unidirectional. There's always the possibility Right, that 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 those commitments will uh, will be uh, you know will will change. Um, at some point, I want to come back to this, but maybe not. Oh, here's my well. So I'm going to come back to this. Returning back to Gutierrez, it's not just past history that he's talking about. It's not just like oh, we can look back and we can see oh, God was at work there. 
right? It's not just this present out there somewhere. Oh yeah, there's liberation, there's God's work. It really is an invitation to ask the question, are we part of God's liberating history, right? Are, are we? I mean, that's the theological claim that Gutierrez stakes. He says there's no such thing as the sacred and the profane. History is one, right? And either we are participants in the process of human flourishing and liberation, or we might be participants in the process of human oppression, right? And so his lens on liberation theology is both looking at history in the past, looking at history and the texture of the present, but also asking us individually, if we take that claim seriously, we have to ask ourselves the question, is repair and reparation part of the salvific work of God? That is a very big theological question, but I think that Gustavo Gutierrez would, would be open to that. So that's, that's where I'm bringing you to. What sorts of questions might we uh, continue to, to think with? Hello. Um, I wanted to kind of go back to the sin of white supremacy. And in our class with Professor Tijes, we uh, discussed, uh, sorry, James H. Cohn before getting into your book. Oh, good. Um, yeah. And then we found that both pieces of literature complemented each other really well. Um, what I found in Cohn's writing of Black Theology of Liberation, he writes it in a form of like a structure that reads as a manifesto mm. of sorts. Mm. Um, he gives like directions and ways in which you should read this text mm -hmm. and how it should be actualized. Mm -hmm. uh, in your book, however, The Sin of White Supremacy, it kind of, it feels like a preface to a manifesto. Mm. So I was wondering, where do you find moments of your manifesto within this book um, so that this can, can be actualized within white members of a, you know, a white supremacist institution? So how can they actualize many of the questions that you ask um, in a similar format of what Cohn tries to do. Yeah, um, so I, I thank you both for that um, really clear uh, analysis and the pressing question. Um, the sin of white supremacy was prompted by James Cohn. In 2004, he wrote an article in which what, what he titled, uh, The Theology's Greatest Sin, Silence in the Face of White Supremacy. And I said, you are absolutely right. And I am part of that, right, in my own silence. Um, and so uh, the, the genre of manifesto, you are inviting me into a different mode of my own, of my own writing. Because you see in the book, and I, I have to own it now that it's written and out there, you see in the book that the, that the, 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 the place I end with is in cultivating changes of heart and changes of relationship. Um, and the, the, the limits of that, right? That, it, that it's not enough just to change hearts. Uh, and I should have been much more uh, directive in the steps of changing hearts, right? So a, a preaching that would, that would actually bring the reality of human flourishing and the racialized reality of human flourishing into our parishes. Uh, a preaching that would do that, the change of hearts of white Christians who would say, oh yeah, I am part of the problem, right? Um, but the, the, the manifesto has not been my mode. When I reread this yesterday, I think that what I was offering for action uh, was in the little section toward the end where I, rec where I use Mamie Till's recounting of the many, many, many people, right, who were part of that transformative moment. And I think that my, my action plan here is not really, uh, uh, it, my action plan here is, look, everybody's got to do something. Everybody's got to step into those locations where they can do something and they have to have the courage to do that work, right? Now, um, it's a, it's a, 
I don't know what the genre is, a manifesto for mobilizing. It's not a manifesto. You're right. And I don't know. Can I make, I, it's not my genre, right? My genre is, hey, by the way, now that you see this, don't you think you should do something different? It leaves it a little bit passive, right? Um, and I, I appreciate that. And I wonder if my, yeah, I, because the manifesto is, we, we got to do this work, right? We've got we've to change our curriculum. We've got to uh, redistribute our wealth. We've got to recognize and relinquish uh, power, right? Um, and, and I appreciate your question because uh, do you think we need manifesto? Do you think the, the genre of suggestion is just a little too weak? I think you're right. I think that it is. It's not the it's not the genre of manifesto. And maybe um, I need to I go back to James Cone and learn a little bit more. I think it's the act of writing a manifesto. It's um, at least when I when reading Cone, it's uh, a radical action. Yeah. It's um it's a proposal. Um, manifestos aren't necessarily written to be followed word for word. Mm -hmm. um, they're like proposals to how can we s start to put these questions and um, desires into action. I don't, ex like I, don't, I don't think manifesto should have the expectation of being fully realized, mm -hmm. only that it's the first step. And, and, and I, I really appreciate your, your invitation and your question because as I'm thinking about the writing of the, the book that I've been working on now, um, I'm still coming to terms with the history, right? I'm still reckoning with whether or not this church can be a location for transformation, right? And, and I think I'm still wrestling with, with my own reading of these historical accounts that I'm finding, right, to say, uh, the enslaved Catholics, when they were following the faith tradition that had been uh, that had been part of the reality of their Jesuit uh, enslavers, right? I'm still reckoning with that. Um, that I I'm not sure I have fully determined for myself how, how what do I think about that. Right? How, how could that have been a living, uh, a, a life-giving experience for them? And yet, when I read their actions and I read their stories, I say, well, it appears to have been a life-giving, the Catholic tradition appears to have been life-giving for them. Um, so am I, am I not yet at the manifesto stage? That is quite possible. I think there was another, another question ready to go. Yeah, I, I had a know if it's a question or a comment, but um, thank you, by the way, for this. I found it really uh, engaging and at some level troubling. Mm -hmm. And l I want to say what the troubling part was for me is when you were talking about the different parts of human flourishing, mm -hmm. and then even this theft side. And I was imagining myself in the pew on Sunday in church, and I think not just at my church, but in probably most churches. <laughs> um, and I would say the theological project or the spiritual project of the church in actuality, right, generally, has nothing to do with those things at all. It's overly spiritualized and overly individualized. And I think the training that is given to many church leaders uh, priests and others is a theology that actually doesn't see those things as particularly relevant to the project of what churches are about. And that disturbs me. So I just made uh, that comment. But I think that that goes, that, that goes uh, in two directions for me. It goes, back to, it goes back to the theology of history that Gutierrez wrote about you know, 50 years ago now, right? Do we think that history is a location in which God has been at work, right? And he, he, it's not only his uh, perspective on history, it's the incarnation. He says, well, the whole, the whole affirmation of the Christian tradition is that God has become part of human history. God deeply cares about human history, 
right? So the so the the practices in our churches that don't ask us to wrestle with this reality and this texture of human history, um, but then 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 the 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 positive pivot for me is that this is not a project of uh, diminishing me. This is a holy work, right? That this would be work that was spiritual in itself, right? That was sacred in its practices. Um, and so this sense of really looking at this and saying, this is part of the spiritual practice that we might be called into, and not to be afraid of it, but to look at it and say, what would it look like, right, for us to ground deeply in the spiritual capital of our Catholic tradition? So I'm writing writing the book with a primarily Catholic audience in view, but looking at the other locations of, of uh, grounding in spiritual capital of our religious traditions. And what would it look like for us to ground in that spiritual capital and say, we're not, af we're not afraid of this. We're not afraid of our past sins because we are part of a, a Christian tradition that says, yes, humanity is sinful, and that's where God's work within us and among us takes place. So, so I appreciate your, your, your uh, portrait there, and I think that that's what the invitation is as a theologian I want to think about. How do we recognize this work as deeply spiritual work? Great. Well, I think we have time for just one more question. Dr. Hill Fletcher, I want to just point out that some students are leaving because they have class at 6. So I just want to thank everyone for sticking around if you don't have class, but we have time for one more question. Thank you. Excellent uh, discussion. My question is, within my own family, I have a sister and a brother-in-law who are on the total opposite side of just about everything we talked about in here today. And I was wondering, how would you guide us as we're talking to someone that we care deeply about that doesn't seem to understand why this is an issue? Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's an excellent question. It's the question that my students and I wrestled with just yesterday, right? This, this reality, and that's what this, the intervening slides here, yeah, you know what? Uh, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, bring you to this slide, and I don't know, uh, I, I find this slide, I find this model helpful. It's gonna take me a while to get to the practical answer to your question. I think that racism is our national historic trauma, right? I, I think that's the reality that when we look back at our history and that many of us experience that and say, I don't want to deal with that. Can't we just not deal with that anymore, right? Can't we, can't we not uh, look at the fact that white, uh, white Americans have greater access to all of these things, right? Um, and that's what I see happening in this, in this denial of history in all of these school boards, that it is deeply traumatic to face racism, right? And that, and that those of us who can say, I don't want to deal with it, have the opportunity to do that. Okay. But I want us to lean into telling the truth, understanding the trauma, and then creating transformed institutions. Um, so what I have found uh, helpful in my own encounters in, in family conversations um, is to find the location of uh, resistance, right? So maybe we're talking about reparations, right? And my, you know, uh, some family member. I, yesterday, I, in my class, I said my uncle Harry, and luckily I don't have an uncle Harry. But you know, that's ridiculous. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pay for somebody else's, uh, you know, the, the, I don't. That's not my guilt. I didn't enslave anybody. I shouldn't have to pay reparations, right? Um, to recognize the place from which uh, our our conversation partners are coming. And then to try to inch towards saying, well, here's what I understand to be the data of why reparations are required, right? That the, that the data says, right, and the history says that these projects by which people of African descent, African Americans were denied wealth building were projects that, that, that went to white people. And I have found that the, you know, when I, when I open up, this has been one of my very favorite, where did it go? Hmm. Somewhere, this mapping inequality, right? When I pull up the computer and I say, hey, look, let's take a really clear look at the means by which our families 
had access to the wealth building of home ownership. And when we can recognize ourselves in this history as beneficiaries, that has sometimes at least been a location from which to say, well, if we can recognize ourselves as beneficiaries, can, could that reshape the way that we feel about the project of repair or the project of reparations? Um, but I think that that question is actually the national question, right? That we've got, we've got many different approaches to the historical uh, uh, trauma of racism, right? But we've got a whole lot of folks who want to say that's ridiculous. History is the past is the past, right? And we want to look at the future. We want to just treat everybody as nice human beings and move forward, right? And I think that we have to hear that desire, right, the positive element of that desire to treat everyone as human beings, but we have to situate that in the broader view of history, right? And so I have found that facing the history and finding data of the history and situating my own family story within that history has allowed me to at least open up uh, places for more complex conversations. Thank you. Our time has come to an end. Please join me in thanking Dr. Janine Hill Fletcher for being with us. Wonderful presentation. Thank you all. You've given us so much to think about. We will continue to do so in our own way here at DePaul. Thank you all. Have a good night. Please remember that our students.